Amen. We'll be preaching today from John chapter 21. And I'll be reading verses 1 through 14. John 21 verses 1 through 14. And the scripture reads as follows. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work and threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, but about a hundred yards off. When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and so with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. The word of God for the people of God. Amen. Amen. I won't be before you long today, but I do want to share a word entitled The Darkness Before Dawn. The Darkness Before Dawn. A few weeks ago, I was awakened by what sounded like an entire flock of birds outside our home, singing to the high heavens. The sound was so audible that I concluded I was either dreaming in high definition or that I really do live in a bird sanctuary. Well, as it happened, I wasn't dreaming, so I decided to get up and record the song offering. Although the sun had not yet risen, the birds were singing a full-throated anthem. I want to play about 20 seconds of the recording of what I heard that early spring morning. I'm no ornithologist, so I did some research to explain this song before the sunrise. The first article that I happened upon was an answer to the question, what makes birds sing so loudly in the morning? During the spring, I read the symphony of bird song in the early morning hours is known as the dawn chorus. The dawn chorus begins in the month of March and lasts until early July. I know this to be true because the birds woke me up during the darkness before dawn on March 29th. As early as 4 a.m., I learned, you may hear the sweet song of the American robin. And as daylight emerges, more birds join in. Altogether, the little birds create a big sound in the morning. For many years, scientists believed that birdsong could travel greater distances in the morning and that birds were simply taking advantage of the greater range to send their message. But recent research revealed that the sound waves of pre-dawn birdsong travels the same distance as noon birdsong. 
the difference between the morning and midday choruses is that early morning is usually a time of stillness with fewer breezes and other daytime noises that might drown out the bird song. So it is, while the sound waves may not be traveling any farther, the morning quiet offers birds an opportune time to blast their message. I believe that God gives us profound revelations from the world of nature if we're open to them. And the revelation here is that the birds are not the only creatures that have a song to sing in the darkness before dawn. I have a song to sing. And you have a song to sing in the quiet stillness before the dawn. And like the birds pre-dawn symphony, our prayers and our praises travel farther in the stillness. There are less noises in the form of the worries and stresses of the day in the darkness before dawn. So our songs rise unfettered to the heavens. I may have been a little annoyed that the bird song woke me up. But in retrospect, I believe that God was sending me a message, a message that said, don't be annoyed by their song, Sean, join the chorus. For this is the time in the quiet stillness before dawn to offer up your prayers and praises, to give voice to your hopes and your struggles. In our scripture reading today, the disciples of Jesus are living through the darkness before dawn. For the disciples, the darkness before dawn was more than the time of day. It marked a disquieting season of their lives. Jesus, we remember, to whom they had pledged their lives to follow, had been crucified and raised from the dead. And although the resurrected Jesus had by then appeared three times to the disciples, things were different. The disciples were not with Jesus every day as they had been before, ministering in Judea and Galilee and being transformed by his teachings. Instead, the resurrected Jesus would appear to remind the disciples of what he had taught them and then disappear. The risen Lord, for example, showed up in a locked room to offer the disciples the blessing of peace and the gift of the Holy Spirit and then left. Or as was the case with the two disciples from Emmaus Road, the resurrected Jesus broke bread before them and then vanished. So the disciples of Jesus were living literally and spiritually through the darkness before dawn. They were struggling to find a way forward in a new post-resurrection reality. We're not doubting the disciples' commitment here. Because the record of history bears the truth that the disciples witnessed to Jesus even unto death, but they were struggling. And I believe that the disciples went fishing that night to sort out their struggle, to mull things over in a different space out on the water. The disciples' internal struggle about how they were going to navigate life and ministry without Jesus was manifested in their outward struggle of not being able to catch one single fish. Struggle, I believe, is one of the most underrated dimensions of our spiritual journey. We have no problems relishing in the blessings of the Lord, and most of us enjoy getting our praise on. And we're fine basking in God's presence and inviting his peace into our, our lives. But struggle, we don't like to struggle. The irony is some of our greatest blessings come through seasons of struggle. You remember reading about Jacob the patriarch in Genesis chapter 32. Jacob was fearing for his life on the eve of an unwelcome meeting with his brother Esau. And the Bible says that Jacob got up at night and sent his family and all of his possessions across the Jabbok River, after which he was left alone. And through the darkness of night, Jacob wrestled with the angel of God. Jacob, I believe, knew then what we need to internalize today, that great blessings come through struggle. So Jacob told the angel as he wrestled with him through the night, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Eventually, Jacob's blessing came through an intense struggle, but blessing through struggle is just one part of this revelation. The other part relates to the timing of the struggle. Jacob, in other words, wrestled through the darkness of night all the way up to the darkness before the dawn. And he received his blessing, the Bible says, at the breaking of day. For a moment, I want to speak to the person who is living through the darkness before dawn. 
You're in the season before the breaking of day. And I want to encourage you in the season you're in to hold on. Don't give up. Very often situations in our lives become unbearably difficult when we're ever so close to our blessing. So hold on. To the folk who are struggling on the brim of a breakthrough, I invite you to meditate on these words of scripture from Psalm 30, verse 5. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. For these millions of years, the morning has come. And as surely as the morning comes, God, after a night season of travail, promises to give us joy. But there's more. The same God promises new mercies with the new morning. Lamentations 3, 22 and 23 says that the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. For those of us living through the darkness before dawn, God's new mercy in the mornings means everything. Because new mercy brings new healing. New mercy brings greater restoration. New mercy brings new life and deeper peace and more blessing. While you meditate on these scriptures, I want to encourage you to try, I, I want you uh, to encourage you to cry out to God in prayer and praise. But I also want you to tell God about your struggles. Why? Because 1 Peter 5 and 7 says that we can cast all our cares upon God because he cares for us. For those who are negotiating the darkness before dawn, I need you to take this home with you. That the darkness before dawn has a name. It's called astronomical twilight. And it's the darkest of the three twilight phases. The other two being civil twilight and nautical twilight. Astronomical twilight begins in the morning or ends in the evening when the geometric center of the sun is 18 degrees below the horizon. In astronomical twilight, sky illumination is so faint that most casual observers would regard the sky as fully dark, especially under urban or suburban light pollution. What I'm suggesting is that in the darkness before dawn, there's light. I'm reminded here of the ninth plague upon Egypt for Pharaoh's refusal to let God's people go. The ninth plague of Egypt, as you biblical scholars know, was the plague of darkness. The Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward the sky so that darkness spreads over Egypt. Darkness that can be felt. So Moses stretched out his hand toward the sky and total darkness covered all Egypt for three days. No one could see anyone else or move about for three days. But there was light. There was light, the Bible says, in Goshen, where the people of God were. The Bible says all the Israelites had light in the places where they lived. Some of you have been there before, surrounded by a darkness that could be felt. But I drove three miles from Damascus, Maryland, to inform you that if you are a child of God, there's light wherever you are. You may feel like the disciples of Jesus struggling in the darkness before dawn, drifting on a sea of perplexity. Your world has been turned upside down and you're not certain about how the next season will unfold in your life. But just as there is light in the darkest phase of twilight, there's light wherever you are. The reason why this commentary about light is so important is because our communion with the light is what initiates the miracle that we need. The disciples of Jesus had been on the Sea of Galilee all night long, groping in the darkness. They were searching all the way up to the time of the darkness before dawn. And although the natural light may have been undetectable to the disciples' naked eyes, they did see Jesus, the light of the world. Initially, they did not recognize him as Jesus, but we can be sure that the disciples perceived the light in him. Why? Because they followed the Lord's instructions when he bid them to cast their nets on the right side of the boat to find the fish. They perceived light in Jesus and followed his instructions in the same way they did three years earlier when Jesus called to them from the same waters to become fishers of men. And when the disciples cast their nets on the starboard side of the boat, as Jesus told them, the Bible says they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. The Apostle John gives us an important detail about the disciples' miraculous catch. 
he wrote that the disciples' catch included 153 large fish. St. Jerome, who is credited with translating the Bible into Latin, put forth the hypothesis that 153 was meant to represent the whole universe of fish. At the time, in the fourth century, some believed that there were 153 species of fish in the world. Well, what does that mean? I believe that it means God can deliver the universe into your net if you heed his voice. Some of you may have missed it, so I will say it again. God can deliver the universe into your net if you heed his voice. Which is to say that God will grant you the desires of your heart if you obey his voice. If you abide in me, Jesus said, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. But the miracle in this passage is not just the catch, it's also in the communion that God, the creator of the universe, would come down to this earth in Jesus Christ and dine with us. Jesus expressed this miracle best in Revelation 3 and 20 saying, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and dine with him and he with me. This brings us back to the initial point of the sermon, the point about joining the chorus of creation in the darkness before dawn. When we join the chorus of creation in offering our prayer and praise and struggle in the darkness before dawn, we invite God's presence into our lives. It's why the psalmist said in Psalm 63, early will I seek thee. And it's why Mary Magdalene, early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, went to the Lord's tomb. When we lift our voices in, in the early anthem, miraculously, the Lord shows up as he did for the disciples on the seashore. In fact, our singular voices in the dawn chorus beckon the God of all creation to dine with us. And I believe that it's there in communion with the Lord that our fears give way to blessed assurance. Our confusion resolves into peace and our struggle is transformed into divine blessing. I want to, I'm finished, but I, I want you to catch the revelation here that, that, that the darkness before dawn is, is probably the most sacred time in our lives. There's, some, there's a mystery there. It's not just me. It's not just that the birds woke me up in the darkness before dawn. I read it in scripture. Why did Mary Magdalene go in the darkness before dawn to Jesus' tomb? It's a mystery. It is a mystery. And, and the thing is, uh, the mystery is etched in creation. I'm saying, why are these birds singing so loud? I'm trying to sleep. Why are they singing and chirping this loud? The, the sun is not even, even up yet. Why are they singing? And as I investigated, I, I found out that it's called the dawn chorus. And God, this may be for you, but God revealed to me, as I sure you shouldn't be annoyed. He said, I need you to join the chorus. <laughs> I need you to join the chorus. I, I want you to hear this, that, that the darkness before dawn is not just about time on the clock. It's also about the seasons that we go through in life. And I'm preaching this because somebody is living through the darkness before dawn. And the reason that I'm, I'm preaching this word is because in the darkness before dawn, is, that's the time that we want to give up the most. The disciples, the disciples had, had, had essentially given up almost. They were out on the sea trying to figure out why Jesus of Nazareth, who was sent to redeem the world, why he died such a horrendous, horrifying death on the cross. I'm sure they were feeling guilt for having fled. I'm sure they were feeling sorry for what had happened to Jesus Christ of Nazareth, that he was crucified mercilessly on a cross at Calvary. But he was raised from the dead and he appeared to them once. He appeared to them twice. He's appearing to them a third time in today's scripture as the disciples are in the dark on the Sea of Galilee and they were not able to catch one single fish. It is, it is emblematic of the darkness before dawn. It seems like in the darkness before dawn, nothing happens. It seems like no doors will open. It seems like no opportunities will come our way. It seems like we're confused and we don't know what to do. They're, they're going to and fro on the Sea of Galilee, unsuccessful. And it's at that, that time, 
in the darkness before dawn because they embraced their struggle that Jesus of Nazareth showed up. And I, I want to tell somebody today before I take my seat that, that, that you ought not give up because Jesus is nearer now than when you first believed. He is as close. He is as close as he was to the disciples when he was standing on the shoreline. He is that close to you right now. But you cannot give up. What God says in this season of your life is that you have to join the chorus. You have to lend your voice. You have to you have to sing your song. You have to raise your hands. You have to praise your God. You have to offer God your struggles. And as you join the chorus, my God, as you join the chorus, my, the promise is, is that day will break, my God. Opportunities will come. Doors will open because you have joined the chorus of creation. And I, I made up in my mind when I was going over this sermon, I said, I'm not going to let another night go by where I'm slumbering. When those birds are singing, I'm going to be singing. When those birds are singing, to the high heavens, I'm going to get on my knees and thank God for another day. It didn't have to be. He gave us another day. He gave us another chance. He gave us another opportunity to praise and worship. I'm going to join the chorus. And I just need about, I need a few of you just to make a commitment, even for, if it's just for this week. Even if it's just for this week, I, I want you to make a commitment for five days. Let's do it seven days. Seven days. I want you, I want you to get up in the darkness before dawn. My God, the revelation is that it is the dark, the darkness before the dawn. It is the darkest phase of twilight. My gosh, Look, I want you to get it. it right before the sun comes up. It, it is the darkest. It is the darkest. It is it's the moment in our lives where we think like we, where we think we can't make it. And God says the sun will rise again. But I need you. I need you to join the course for, for seven days. I want you, I want you in the darkness before dawn, I want you to get out of your bed and I want you to talk to God. I don't, I don't, you can pray, you can pray to God, you can praise God and you can tell him all about your struggles, but I want you to connect with God. I want you to connect before the sun comes up. I want you to connect with God before the day begins. I want you to connect with God before the problems, before people come to you with their problems. I want you to connect with, before you can begin to ruminate on your problems. I want you to connect with God. And, and the promise, God's promise to us, God's promise to us is that he will meet us. He will meet us and he will dine with us and we with him. And I believe, I believe that the, the longings that we have in our heart, the longings that we have, the, 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 the mysteries that we need to be revealed to us, they happen in the darkness before the dawn. I want, I, want you, I want you to do it this week. I want you to make a commitment. I'm done, but I want you to stand right now because the prayer today is for those who are living through the darkness before dawn. I'm praying that you will see the light of Jesus Christ through the mists, through the clouds, through the shadows, that you will see Jesus who is calling you from the shoreline, inviting you into communion with him. Even as I pray that you would see Jesus, I'm praying that you would hold on for the miracle you've been waiting for. Very often that miracle comes at the breaking of day when darkness gives way to light. If you want to receive this prayer, I, I, I ask that you uh, every head bowed, every eye closed right now in Jesus name, in Jesus name. God, God, we thank you for day and we thank you for night. We thank you, God, for what you created for our benefit. And God, even now, we, we thank you for the darkness that comes before dawn, for the, for the times of confusion and for the times of brokenness and for, for the times of pain and, and anguish. God, we thank you even for that type of darkness. But we thank you, God, that, that you have created light in us. And very often, God, we're, we're slumbering when we should be awake, God. And so we're asking on this week, God, that you would wake us up. That you would not, not just wake us up out of the bed, God, but you would awaken our consciousness. That you would awaken our minds to the reality of your glory. And God, we're, this week, God, we're, we are pledging to join the dawn chorus. To lift our voices to you even before the day begins. And we know, God, that, that you will answer our prayer. We're going to cry aloud to you, aloud that you may hear us. And God, we know that you're going to answer our prayer. And on this week, God, as we as we open our hearts and as we open our minds to you, as we imagine what it must have been like for the disciples to have breakfast uh, uh, with Jesus or by the seashore of Tiberias, God, we're going to commune with you. 
We're going to commune with your Holy Spirit. We're going to speak to you, God, and we're going, we're, we're going to get the answer that we have been waiting for on this week. In Christ's name we pray. Let every heart say amen. Amen. amen.